Thank you for being here. Believe it or not, this is one of my favorite things in the world to talk about. So I'm very excited to have you all here. Um, let's see all of you.
something as a memorial of beloved who was a person of the stage. He planned his blessed day down to the last period on the page. <laughs> he chose the music, the players, the script, and the setting. It was grand, but brief, as he didn't want the length to be too upsetting. His friends and family gathered, cried, but most importantly, laughed. He knew that planning a funeral was a simple yet essential craft. As I left, I nodded my head, noting that one person had done the planning, and indeed he made it as much as he could purely enchanting. With all the sadness of those left behind as we began our journey of grief, we can hold on to those few moments as that respite of relief. As I consider my funeral, I imagine the joy of which I will be in the midst. As my beloved family and friends sit looking at Mother's detailed checklist. As they read it, I hope that they will read between the lines and realize the tone amidst the colorful notes and designs. That I am joyful, I am happy, have no fear, I am just within arm's reach. While I know that you are suffering, you must know I am on God's very own beach. <laughs> but yes, now is the time to plan my party, my send-off, my final earthly event. Please just remember that I want confetti, balloons, a touch of scotch in the midst of lament. <laughs> Because for me, a good funeral is more than only a service to be done, but a sign that there is more to come for you, me, each and every loved one. So let's plan the fun and fabulous funeral of our dreams. Maybe not one filled with the total party of our teens, but I pray that my funeral will hold meaning, bring hope, and share love. As I hear the word, good and faithful servant, uttered by our beloved God up above. So that's my, one of my favorite funerals I attended. Uh, it was a gentleman, he, he was an actor, and um, he, he had his funeral plan, I think, like 20 years. I mean, this was like a long time coming, um, and he was very open about that he had planned it, and, you know, down to the T, and the pastor who was, um, doing the funeral, he said, like, I, like, even the words that I'm saying are kind of by him. I mean, obviously, he was the one, you know, preaching and, and doing the funeral, but um, that his hand was really in it. So, um, while we may not do as much detail as that gentleman, um, you know, we, we are also called to, as much as we'd like to, um, plan our own funerals as well. So, what... Um, what is one funeral um, that you all have attended um, that you found really meaningful? That was really, you were like, that's the one. That's, that's what it should be. Okay, it will hopefully restart while, while we're talking. Well, I, I like my dad's funeral. Well, that's kind of weird to say that. But um, no, he was one of nine kids, and he was the first. Uh, he had two sisters that preceded him by mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. So he was the first, like, you know, uncle, so to speak, yeah. that died. <coughs> and uh, and so there's a lot of people around for that funeral. Mm -hmm. And it was like my mom's family and my dad's family, and they were all together mm -hmm. in the same room, and it was bizarre. <laughs> you know, we right? all had family reunions yeah. out, you know, in one side, the other, you know, and I never saw them both together like that, which yeah. was cool. I mean, you know. It really is so special to see people. Who, I, I, I think all the family funerals I've been to, and every time I'm like, I didn't know you, you know, and I've never seen you together, and it's it's really beautiful, you know, to have that kind of gathering. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank I you. remember John Kushke's um, service. That mm. it, it, Joy, it was for John, not Joy, John, and um, the whole. Fam, did you go? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the whole family participated. They sang. I can't remember it 
know, but I just remember it was, it was definitely something very creative that mm -hmm. the family had all put together for John. Yeah, so I did Joyce's funeral. It was oh. the first funeral I did when I came here. They actually contacted me for like a few weeks before I started and were like, can you please do our funeral? Oh. I was like, I don't know who this is, but I'm going to find out. And, and they did a mirror almost of the same. They wanted mm -hmm. the same hero because that one was so joyful to them <coughs> and collaborated and, and sang all together. So I know from, from that side that it was a really meaningful funeral to have the collaboration and you know, bringing the family really into it. It was very creative. Yeah. It, it, it was something a service I'd never been to before. Mm -hmm. Usually funerals are pretty standard, but yeah. that was so different it sticks in my mind. Yeah. That's wonderful. I had the privilege of doing Paige Lamadou's funeral. Mm -hmm. Anybody heard of Paige's uh -huh. funeral? Mm -hmm. Well, at first they, the girls had always picked up, he, he loved music and he was a composer, so um, he picked out all this music and Matt wasn't able to do it, so I played. I thought I was in a, in a bar for the opening, so of Gershwin. <laughs> and then he had a brass ensemble, and they picked up all the hymns, and he went out to 76 trombones. Oh my God! And then the end was, those of you who were here, I'm, it was an extravaganza, but it was so paid. It was done with so much love, and it was such a privilege to be able to do that for him. It's really a gift. But the, the family really, the girls put on an, an awful lot of effort. All of them spoke, and a very dear friend of them, Heather Morrison, who's a Presbyterian pastor, did the homily. And uh, it was just fun. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> 76 trombones, okay, this is good. <laughs> I did not know that, so I, 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 I'll show you the video. I would love to see. I thought, well, Nikki had said that she. She listens to that video a lot. Yeah, I'll say it to you. It was really pretty amazing. Oh, yeah, it was all his favorite music. And, but also grounded with, you know, uh, Mighty Fortress and Joyful Joyful, but I mean, it was all the hoopla. Yeah. It was really fun. But also what he wrote. Pardon me? You played what he wrote. I know, I played what he wrote. Right? Yeah. And, uh, some, and there was a friend that sang one of his songs too. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah. Someone had told me that Paige had planned that whole thing. Oh yeah. Oh yes. Oh yeah. Okay. yeah the girls. Yes. I mean that would have gone on for a few hours. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many years ahead he had planned it, yeah. but he set the groundwork. He had all his favorite songs, ballads, you know, mm -hmm. to, to Nikki. It was just really precious mm -hmm. and sweet. It was very much him. Yeah. It was an honor to be able to do that for him. That's beautiful. I think that's the one thing though that that somebody really has things planned out mm -hmm. because I think there's nothing worse than when everybody's kind of standing there like, what do we do? Yeah. 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 And I remember going way back when somebody said to me, okay, you're in music, pick out the hymns that you would like to be sung. And I said, why would you do that? I said, because there's certain hymns that I would like to be sung. Yeah. You yeah. know, and they mean something. Mm -hmm. to you yeah. and you know why not yeah. but I think it also makes it much less stressful to the family when as you said you know he had everything mapped out what he knew he wanted included mm -hmm. and so on and then it really can be a joyful day and celebration yeah. of the person who's passed yeah. it takes it not only brings meaning but it, I mean it also helps those of us who are left behind who are kind of like what did you, what would you have wanted? You know, what would you like to see? Right, it? whether it's sudden or they've been ill for quite a while, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it still brings the stress level yeah. down. Yeah, absolutely. Any other funerals that were really meaningful or beautiful or powerful um, that you all have been attended? Well, we have many more. I have more prompts for you um, <laughs> shortly. So what are some feelings, questions that you would like to ask in relation to funerals or funeral planning? Um, I think a lot of them will hopefully be answered as we kind of go through everything. Uh, but I'd, I'd love to um, answer questions at the end um, if there are particular things that are kind of on your mind that you've been like, what is this? Or why, you know, why do we have this? Or what is the... Uh, purpose or what should I be thinking about in, in planning funerals? What are some questions that um, we could ask? Yeah. So if um, the, the older person, like a mother or father, uh, passes and they have not picked out a place to bury, mm, yeah. what they do in the cave, bury, mm -hmm. what state, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, in my case, it's a difficult. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a hard one. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to answer all the questions at the end. I'm just going to gather the questions, and I think some of them will be answered as we go. Uh, but thank you. Yeah, so um, terrific. Any other, what other questions do you all have? Who's it for? Who's it for? Mm -hmm. Who's the funeral for? Mmm, that's good. That's good. What if the uh, the person who passed is is the faithful person, but it's not part of a church family? Mm -hmm. you know, especially a lot of elderly people, maybe been in home for a while. Yeah, yeah. Is it still considered a funeral if you have just a grave sign? Mm. Um, service. Mm. That's a good question. Yeah. What, what, what is a funeral? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. How, how much input do we need to get from other people? How much input do we need? Yeah. Are you talking more like the leaders? Of I'm talking about self and also mm -hmm. if you're planning a funeral for say you know, say a, a parent or something. How much input do we owe to the rest of the family? Mm, yeah, that's a hard one. <laughs> Any time you have to deal with family, it's a hard one. Yes, yes. How do you convey to the officiant if mm. that person does not know the deceased? Mm. Having yet to meet anyone who I have done so far funerals here, that is a very good question. <laughs> it's it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, but we'll we'll talk we'll talk more about that. Yeah. yeah. This sounds morbid, but should you have a plan for yourself in case you go to pass? Because I have three sons, and I don't think they would know what to do with me. So. Yeah. <laughs> I, yes, I do. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that a lot of a lot of people don't, you know, because they're, you know, especially if you're younger, it's like, oh, I have the rest of my life to figure that out, you know. But ultimately, we know. I mean, you can be any age, and it doesn't matter, you know. I mean, we should have, you know, literally the entire congregation here because, you know, you can be, you know, really young. It doesn't doesn't matter the age. Yeah, absolutely. Should you write your own obituary or leave it to chance? <laughs> leaving that, leaving that to chance. But but yeah, some people do, right? You know, some people do write their write their own obituaries. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions before we jump into the rest? Yeah. How much family participation can there be? Mmm, that's a good that's a good one. Yeah, because there are some people that have a lot of family, right? You know, that especially there's lots of brothers and sisters and grandchildren. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Anything else? These are really good questions, you guys. This is good. Yeah, yeah. There's a big difference between the person who's younger and is suddenly hurt, yeah. either with an accident or something, mm -hmm. and someone who's lived their whole life and celebrating, yeah. where the younger person, you know, we're not necessarily celebrating, we're still shocked and grieving. Absolutely, absolutely. And I don't know what the question is, actually. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that is, it's so hard. I did one funeral of a community member who was a member of this church that um, was looking for someone to do a funeral, and she was 40, had cancer, wanted to have children, didn't have the opportunity to have children, you know, it was very difficult, so... It's, it's a very different experience, you know, doing that versus someone who has lived a long life. All right. And if you, if you have more questions as we go, please just interrupt me, um, and I will either write it down or, or answer them. So those are all such good questions. Fabulous. All right. So good. The Good Funeral. So this is one of my favorite books. It's more for pastors, but if you're really interested in funerals, 
This is a really cool book to read. <laughs> you like me. This was one of my favorite in, in seminary. Um, one of my, um, uh, she was my main professor, um, supervised my um, thesis, and she actually just had her funeral. She passed away, um, only 51, amazing woman. She had cancer. Um, but she loved talking about funerals, and her funeral was a standing room only funeral that was, it was two hours long, which I was like, oh my gosh, this is so long, I don't think you would have wanted this, Dr. Waters. Um, but, you know, fully represented who she was, so um, this book has extra meaning um, for me um, now, having that she was the one that gave me this, so. Um, it's written by um, Tom Long, and you all, have been, has anyone heard of Tom Long? Really fabulous theologian, written like a million books, uh, really great um, teacher, professor, um, as well as preacher. I've gotten to hear him preach a couple of times. It's really great. Um, and then Tom Lynch, who is a funeral director. So they co-wrote this, kind of looking at what does a funeral look like from both of those perspectives, which are different. They write very differently, um, but, but equally important components of what it needs to be to have um, a funeral. So what do you think makes a good funeral and then we're going to hear what, what they say um, about it what makes a good funeral humor hmm? humor humor yes all my favorite funerals have somebody makes a joke it's it's just so wonderful and it often captures the person you know that we're not doing it you know as as kind of a sort of sacrilegious you know kind of thing you know and having humor but that it really captured who the person was and, and continues to be in our hearts as well. Yeah. Limiting the number of people that speak at <laughs> <laughs> So the funeral that I was referring to, I think they had like 12 people. Oh. Who were doing everything. I mean, all wonderful. I mean, they're all, you know, these well established preachers and speakers, and everything. I was like, oh. tradition in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that, you know, and that's where, for from the officiant perspective, usually fall back on that. You know, if the family doesn't know what they want, often fall back on you. What do we normally kind of do, you know? Um, and that our tradition is really beautiful, you know, oftentimes, and, and speaks to the person that's, especially if they are, are in Anything else? What makes a funeral good? All right, well, we're going to hear from our, our two Tom here, Long and Lynch. So this one, I think this one was, actually, I think both of the quotes I have are, are in this, but they kind of capture the whole um, book. So, um, it became clear to me early on that a death in the family presented both the most faith-shaking and religiously charged among life's many changes, and it is certain that many souls have been irreversibly won and irretrievably lost 
because of something said or read or sung over the dead in earshot of the living. I love this quote because I've seen both sides happen and it's wonderful when, you know, irreversibly one, I mean, we've had, um, even here I've seen other churches, you know, folks who, you know, either haven't attended in a long time or are new to the church who are now attending because of the funeral of a loved one. And it's so beautiful to see and that this is a community of faith that supports them in their grief, in their journey, um, and it started with a funeral, I think is the most beautiful thing that can be. But the flip side of that is that there's also a great deal that can be lost from it. If something is said or read or sung that does not hit right with, with our folks. And I'm sure many of you have witnessed that in some way, shape, or form. You know, either either the officiant or someone speaking in the funeral, or even, you know, a guest at a funeral saying something. It can, you know, just like a church service, you know, in a funeral when the emotions are high can also cause um, a rift, you know, in, in faith and can cause people to turn away from the church and not come back, um, which, which is really hard. So that's why it's important, you know, the planning, the thinking through, you know, who do we want to be speaking, who do we want to be reading, you know, are, are elements that are important in, in planning a funeral. All right, this is the second part. So if a good burial can't make a dead person more holy, and a bad burial can't break the protection of God, then why be concerned about burial at all? Augustine advances two well-crafted reasons. First, Caring tenderly for the dead benefits the living. It increases their faith and provides meaning, comfort, and hope to them. Second, those who bury the dead are performing a piece of theater in which they act out the deepest truths they know about life and death. All right, so we have two parts of it. We have the, the part which I would say is the most important part, the the meaning making, the comfort, the hope, that's, that's, what, that's what my role is and that's what the role of the funeral is, is to comfort those of us who are left behind. It's caring, it's being the pastoral presence for those people. But it's also this act of, of theater, and I don't, want, I don't want you to think that I'm, I'm saying you know, that it's not a, a service. It, you know, under, under my documents, it's, it's worship and then funerals. You know, it is still a worship service. We are not only celebrating the person, we're celebrating God in this. Um, but it's telling us something. It's telling us something about life, it's telling us something about death, and it's telling us something about who we are as people and, and why we should keep going and why we are also to find meaning in our lives as well. So those are, those are two things from um, The Good Funeral. There's a whole bunch more, and, and they're hilarious. Speaking of humor, they're always bringing, their humor is just fraught in, in their... Um, work, which is wonderful. So we're going to go through the players and locations. And so these are all the pieces that bring together what a funeral looks like. So I would say the number one thing, the number one role player in all of this is the family. So the family is the one who, who I'm speaking with. I'm the direct contact to. They are the ones, who, and whatever that looks like. When we were talking about there's often many family members but typically there's one or two people who are the point person. Um, and I have yet to, I think the most that I've ever spoken to one time when I'm you know, talking about funeral and we're planning is three people. But even aside from that, like one or two people are the point person. And so as a family, you're, you're kind of the ones to figure out who are those people, who are those are point people um, for planning the funeral. And that doesn't mean that we're not then supporting the rest of the family as well. That's you know, equally um, important. Um, but you're also finding those one or two kind of point people who you're um, you know, giving this planning sheet to or you know, having be the, the ones to kind of you know, decide what the funeral is going to look like. And then, so, you know, this is more attendees, but also important are the friends. And I, I have to say, some of the best eulogies I've heard are said by friends. So while the family is, you know, often it's, it's wonderful to have a family member doing one of the eulogies, 
the friends are sometimes the ones who spend the most time with the person who's passed away. Um, and they're the ones who, I know, because of the slight separation, while they are still going through immense grieving process, they're the ones who are able to deliver the words that fully encapsulate the person um, in that time. Because often, you know, even though there may be long illnesses, you don't write your eulogy for the person. Typically, you know, you maybe have a week. Like, you don't have that long. Sometimes there's a couple of days. I did a funeral recently where um, they wanted two days later, and it was clear that the, the two people who were doing the eulogies, they did a beautiful job, but they only had a day to, to write their eulogies. Um, so you don't have a lot of time, and the family members sometimes, you know, they just are not, they're still processing. They're, you know, in the beginning of the grief stages and aren't able to really um, express what maybe that person wanted. So just something to think about, you know, um, I think friends are really wonderful, and they're the, the people who often travel the longest and most closely um, with you. So the third um, under this is um, the unknown attendees. So often there are people who will come to a funeral who you had no idea were going to come. And they're the ones who, you know, we're, as, as the officiant and those of us who are leading in the service, we're, we're there for everyone. So that includes, you know, the estranged brother, the friend who we haven't heard from in 50 years, you know, the, the, the person, you know, who maybe we knew, you know, from childhood. So, um, and those are people who, I think are important to be thinking about, you know, in planning the funeral, like who, you know, think of that childhood friend. What do I want to tell them, you know, in my funeral? What is it, what's the kind of last message that I want to give to them um, as well? Which I think is pretty cool to be thinking about the breadth of people, you know, and oftentimes we think, oh, no one will come to my funeral. Like, you know, it, I, I wasn't that, you know, I, I had my people, but I didn't have my people. No, it is more likely you will have so many people there that you never imagined would be there. Um, and more often, it's, it's always more than, than you think, which is wonderful. I mean, for those of us left behind to know that all these dear people are going to be there. And it's so meaningful um, to the families as well. So then moving over to um, the, the people who are helping facilitate all this. So it's the, the pastor and leader is kind of the point person. Um, in this, and that means, you know, and I take as much of a role or as little role as the family wants. Whatever it is, I, I'm there to, to do whatever they need or want. Um, sometimes that means doing the whole thing. Sometimes that means, you know, doing the homily and I let them do everything else. Um, it, it, it's different for every family, for every situation. Um, and so, you know, Sometimes, you know, if, if I'm not here, if, you know, if the, your, you know, your pastor isn't here, um, you may have another leader do it. We've had um, Carol Johnson, actually, when she was um, chair of the deacons, uh, there was a funeral I couldn't go to, and she facilitated it. So it doesn't always have to be a pastor. You can have another trusted person um, to be that leader, um, and it's okay. You can often, it, it's just as meaningful, if not more meaningful, um, for that. The second uh, person is the musician, choir director, whoever it is who is who's doing the music. And if it's someone like Paige Lamadou, you know, you're gonna need a lot more, you know, a help with with that. Yeah, yeah. So you know, thinking about you know, do I want soloists? Do I want a choir? And do I want you know, what is music looking like? It's obviously more meaningful for some people, less meaningful for other folks. So. Um, music and then the musician and leaders um, are important to be thinking about under those people that you're also equally um, working with as well. And then we have the last person here is the sexton. So the sexton plays an important role because they are the sort of behind the scenes person doing everything. So they are, you know, however you want your the setup, you know, if there's a body, if you have cremation, um, they're the ones taking care of all of that. And so they're a very important role player who you don't really see, but they are there behind the scenes doing almost everything. Um, and I'm often, you know, whoever the sexton is, whether it's, you know, done, you know, in the church or in a funeral home, they're the person that I'm, I, I cling to and I find, you know, and they're um, doing a lot of the, the work. So moving over to location. So we have two important locations. First is the funeral location, and the second is the burial location. 
Um, so the funeral location, I expect, for you all are members of this church, and so I expect that you will likely have your funeral here. That's okay if you don't. Typically, it's, you know, if you're a member of a church, that's where um, the funeral is. Um, but, it, you know, it's important to think about, um, you know, what location is important to you. What would be most meaningful to you? What would be most meaningful to your family? Um, because it's important. It's important to have, you know, especially, you know, for all of you, very involved in this congregation to have it in, in your in your home, um, whatever whatever home you place as your your home. And then the second, you know, it will depend on if you're having a burial or if you have a pre, if, if you have cremains, um, the burial location will change. So that's important to be thinking about where 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 are you going to end up? Where is your body going at the end of the day? Um, and that's going to be completely different for all of us. Um, but it's important to be to be thinking about. And then all this goes into the funeral. So all these players, the locations, everything um, at, culminate in, in what is the funeral. So what does planning look like? So I thought it would be helpful to tell you kind of what planning looks like from my end, and then that helps in kind of thinking about from your end what that um, also looks like. So first we get the call, often it's the front office, sometimes it's through another through a member of the congregation um, that we find out that someone has passed away. And you know, we talked about how um, you know, it's not always a church member, right, who, who needs um, help in, in planning a funeral and having a funeral. Um, and and we're, I, I'm completely open to doing funerals for non-members as well. It doesn't matter to me, you know, if somebody wants a funeral, needs a funeral, I'm happy to do it. Um, and so, you know, we figure out the coordination around that. So then immediately we contact the family. You know, often this is a quick turnaround, um, sometimes a week, sometimes less, um, and we find a time to meet. So I really, look, I really, really prefer in person. It doesn't always happen. Folks, you know, are traveling from everywhere, and so sometimes it has to be over the phone. But I really prefer meeting, you know, at least two people from the family. Sometimes only one is able, comfortable, willing to um, talk to me. That's fine. Um, but I really like to have two sort of perspectives, two different people from the family um, who I'm going to be um, communicating with. So when I, when the Family, when I contact the family, I talk with them. The first thing that I say before our meeting is, you know, think of two things. So the first is think about what scriptures you would like to have at the funeral. What, what would your, you know, parent, child, you know, family member like to have? Um, it's helpful, obviously, if there's something written down, but uh, I have yet to experience that, and so that's why, hence why we have these forms here today. Um, because I want something that's meaningful. You know, I'm, I'm willing to preach on whatever they, you know, are comfortable with, would like to see. Um, you know, I often say, you know, go through their Bible, see if there's anything that's, you know, red underlined, you know, that was meaningful to them or something that they talked about a lot. Um, willing to bring in poetry if that's meaningful. Um, but think about the scripture that would be most meaningful to them. And then consider who you would like to speak at the funeral, both the eulogies and the readings. So we often have three, two to three readings um, per funeral. And so that means, you know, it's meaningful if it's not me who's the one, you know, reading it. I mean, while I'm happy to do it, most often I read at least one of them, it's more meaningful to have the family doing that as well. So, you know, if they're not comfortable doing a eulogy, that's another option to give them as well. So those are the two things that I first tell families before I see. So the most important part to me of, of the whole funeral process is meeting with the family. And like I said, I really prefer meeting in person. I just am able to get to know the family better. But if not, it's okay. We can do it um, you know, on Zoom or on the phone. Um, so there's two parts to this. So the first is, so we go over what are the scriptures that are, you know, you want, you know, I, I send them, so I print out a list of scriptures that I often use if they're like, I have no idea, you know, so I give them a list of things that I often preach on and use for funerals. Um, sometimes they choose from that, sometimes they bring other things, which is wonderful, and I much prefer something that's specific to that person. Um, so I, I ask that, you know, what are the scriptures that you're thinking about? If they have no idea, you know, I've talked through a couple that I think might work. Um, and we, we kind of land on those. Then we talk about hymns, which many of them, 
that I've experienced where like, I have no idea, find something that's good. Sometimes there'll be, oh, this one was really you know important and they'll have the one. And then um, Matt usually will choose the other two based on the scripture text. So, so that's kind of how it can work. And then three, who are, who's doing the eulogies? Who are, if you want eulogies, is there something that's, um, you know, is there someone who you really want to have speak? Um, sometimes it's still up in the air until the day of. Sometimes um, we usually try to get you know in the bulletin of who's going to be doing it, but we don't always, and that's okay. Uh, part two is the longest part and the time that I really spend a lot of time um, talking about. And the first is sort of the biography or obituary. So you, typically I will have read the obituary already, but I really want to get a feel for who that person was and. You know, who, who were they from your perspective? Not, you know, what did they do? That's all well and good. But who were they really? You know, what were they um, to you in your family? So we spent a pretty good time um, with that. Some people don't have a lot to say, which is fine. Um, <coughs> sometimes I'll talk to them later, you know, say like, mm, I wasn't sure about this. Like, can you tell me more? Which they're usually open to. Um, and the second part is hearing their stories and memories, which... It's always so much fun. I love hearing, you know, I always say, you know, what are like two memories that were really meaningful to you? And it's just so lovely to hear these stories that were really impactful and really encapsulated the person. Um, and, and oftentimes that's when like, we'll just laugh. I have yet to experience a, a, one of the, you know, these uh, family meetings without at least, at least some small laughter in it. Um, because they're usually funny stories that people tell, which is beautiful, and I love it, and just it means the world to, um, you know, be a part of that experience of, of learning more about the person. So, so that is what planning looks like from from my perspective, and what um, my experience is, which might be helpful to all of you um, in planning your own funerals. So what can the church do for you? So <laughs> many things, but in this case, it appears. Um, so the staff and pastors are here to guide you through the whole process. No questions are off the table. Anything that you can think of, we probably heard, and you know, we're, we're here to answer all of your questions. Um, Kay is often the one who's doing a lot of the sort of background work. You know, everyone is on board with um, helping through the funeral process. And we will take as much lead or as little lead as you want. Um, I can you know, plan the whole service, I can plan none of it. You know, it's, it's totally up to you um, in whatever is most helpful to you um, and your family. So we also have deacons and Stephen ministers who are also always available. You know, if, it's, if, if the whole family needs support, we are here. Deacons and Stephen ministers, raise your hands. There are so many of you around. Oh my gosh, we've got so many around the room. I am here to support you as well um, in whatever way you need. Um, and then follow up. So long after the funeral is over, <clears throat> I'm often sending, we have our student ministry grief books, which I send um, throughout the year. We have our grief support group and other support as well. So we are here for the whole journey, not just the funeral. So you all probably can't read this. This is too tiny because you are, and you are all the way by there. So I'm just going to read through um, kind of what a typical order of worship looks like. So this is this was one I did about a year. Let's see, oh, this was uh, around a, a little a little over a year ago. Um, and this is a super simple structure. There is no extra music. There's it, it's very basic. Um, so I thought this would be helpful just kind of see what a basic one um, looks like. So we have prelude, welcome. I usually keep the welcome very short, um, just kind of you know saying you know if they're not from the church, you know say you know this is, this is the Presbyterian Church in Morristown, I'm the associate pastor, da da da. Um, could be a little longer if there's you know directions of you know that you know the burial is after and another location, um, if there's a reception and that sort of thing. Um, but mostly just make people feel welcome and cared for and, and loved in that in that very first. Then we have a call to worship, which um, is usually based on a scripture reading. We have a hymn, and then we have a prayer of invocation, so starting the service off, really getting getting going. That's usually very short. 
Um, and then we go into the reading. So sometimes, we'll, depending on what you want, we'll have two to three readings. Um, if they're short, which many times they are, because people just are, you know, say, oh, I only like these two verses, then I'll say, oh, let's do three readings. If they're longer, then we'll have two readings. Psalm 23 is like 90% of the time one of those readings. Um, here we have a couple others. These were both, you know, two, three verses, so I was like, let's do three. I think that would work better. Um, and then in between those, somewhere in there, we have, you know, the eulogies. This one only had um, one eulogy. Um, it was the mother um, of her daughter passed away, who I was referring to um, earlier. Um, she was the only eulogy. So she took, she took quite a bit of time. It, it would have been equal to five, two eulogies. Um, usually I say, you know, keep it to three, four, five minutes. Um, but it can obviously vary in length. Some people go on long, some, some only will, it will be 30 seconds and they're done. Um, then we have another hymn, Amazing Grace was that one. Then we have a reading um, that I'm usually focusing on for my homily. So um, those are usually paired together. Um, the homily I keep pretty short because I want the focus to be more on the eulogies. Um, while I'm, you know, happy to and, you know, and enjoy doing the homily, I really want the focus to be on those who are speaking, those who knew the person. Especially if I didn't know the person. Like I said, I had yet to do a funeral here where I didn't, where I did know the person. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't feel that I can speak to them as, as well as the family members um, can. And then we have prayer to Thanksgiving. Those are uh, almost pretty long. Well, they're, they're a good, good chunk. Um, and then we close with another hymn, the commendation, which um, I'll talk about a little more with the burial as well. But we have the commendation in the service and the benediction in the closing. So this is a pretty basic kind of structure of what um, a, a funeral will look like. So has anyone, is this kind of what people have seen? What are some variations that you all have seen um, with funerals? Anything extra or different that you've noticed before? Like somebody else said, you know, we, we had one with just a grave site. Mm, so yeah. it, it, it didn't have all the music and all the stuff. It was very, very Yeah, yeah. Very yeah, and that can even, that can also be the case if it's only a funeral home. So I did one funeral recently where there was no music. So it's just in a funeral home. They didn't want a musician. And so, you know, it's 25, 30 minutes max. Um, without the music, which is fine, but um, I love having the music myself. So I, I really, I always miss it. I'm always like, oh, I can hear it in the church instead. But you know, if, if the family wants in the funeral home, that's that's where they would be. Anything else? Any sort of differences, additions, different things that you've seen? If you've been to a bunch of Presbyterian churches, you've probably seen this structure. But um, you know, sometimes there will be, you know, in like the Episcopal Church, there's like communion, and it can be a lot longer. Um, but for the most part, this is this is the structure that that we use. So there's so that's the the little. Oh, I should have that up. You couldn't turn that. Maybe here. Yeah. Um, so the committal. So the committal is typically you know either. At the cemetery, or you know, in some other location, I've done a couple back here in our, our garden, but most of the time have been um, going to a cemetery. And this is very short. I mean, like six, seven minutes at the most. Um, and it's while while you know we can make it, you know, matching the, the funeral. Um, I keep to mostly the same words for every committal. Um, because they're meaningful words, it's a very short time. People are standing around often, you know. I mean, sometimes you'll have care set up and all that sort of thing, um, but it's usually short, and we have a lot of people standing, and the weather is very often bad, and so it's just it's just better to keep it short. Um, so this includes a couple scripture sentences, um, the committal of the body, the Lord's prayer, a short prayer, um, and a blessing. And oftentimes, I'm using the Book of Common Worship for this. Um, sometimes my own, own journey as well. Just a question on that. Yeah. The difference between a funeral and a memorial service, mm -hmm. is there a difference? 
So a memorial you typically means that there is no body. So mm -hmm. I mean, even though we often call everything a funeral, technically it means there's a body if there's a funeral. If it's a memorial service, there is no body present. Um, it, but we often say funeral. You know, it, it, they're just kind of used interchangeably. But technically, that's that's what it is. Well, the committal wouldn't be part of that service. So the committal is totally separate. So so it's funeral memorial is the first part, and the committal, which can be at a different time altogether. It could be months later. You know, I did one. Um, when was it? I guess the beginning of the summer, um, because they couldn't bury, you know, the cremains because the ground was cold. It was January, and so they had to wait until it was springtime. Yeah. Um, and so that's, you know, it can often be six months later, um, which sometimes is good because then you might get family attend that who couldn't attend the funeral. Um, it just kind of depends on on the weather. And, Yeah. I just thought, yeah. it, it goes back to the planning, people who plan and mm -hmm. you know, pick out things for the, their own service. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had anybody actually leave something, a message behind, either something in writing to be read or mm -hmm. maybe even a video or something? Mm -hmm. I have not experienced that, but that would be so cool. And I would love that if somebody <laughs> did that. Um, yeah, I have, I, have not, I have not experienced that before. Um, Pretty sure I've seen that in movies, though. <laughs> well, you see them in the movies that are reading them. Well, I, you know, I am not giving you anything because. Yeah, 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 ye
Um, I would like to be buried or my ashes placed or scattered at fill in the blank. And you know, if you don't know, you do not have to fill, if you don't know something that's on here, you don't have to fill it up. Um, so this is just something for you to think about. Um, and then, you know, I, I have this in here, you know, individuals you would like to have participate in the service if they are comfortable and able. So, you know, this, you know, if you write this now and your funeral's in, you know, 100 years, um, you know, that the, these people may not be here either. And so, <laughs> it's, you know, it, it's just, you know, for us to be thinking about who are those people, maybe even not that are speaking, but we need to be contacting, we need to be talking to, I need to be contacting, talking to, to find out more about you, more about your story, or whoever it is who's going to be giving your service. Um, then I have pallbearers, it's applicable. Um, hems you would prefer, so two or three are suggested. Um, if you're like my mom, who has seven different hems so that she wants to have at funeral, <laughs> you're more than welcome to put all those down. More likely than not, you will not be having all those at your funeral, but go ahead, write them all down. Um, and then other special music. So if there's you know a soloist that you really want, you know, or, or some you know some special music, um, like Paige, like you were talking about, you know, with all the special music, um, include that. Um, preferred or favorite scripture text. So I have a few printed out. I, I will print out some more um, of, of suggested ones. But really, what are those scripture texts that you love? You know, what are those ones that you really want that are meaningful to you um, in some way? Um, and then other instructions, so whatever you feel so moved to write down. And this is just a guideline. This is for, for us to be thinking as a group about what we might want, um, you know. And then, you know, you can rewrite this. You can throw this away, if, however you want. So I have pens up here. Um, those of you who are in chairs, grab a Bible or what? Yes. I was going to say, my dad did this. Your dad did? Oh, that was the greatest gift. Yes. Ever. Yeah. Yeah. We just walk in. Yeah. And do we want it? Yeah. I would never guess. Yeah. So it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, Sharon. Um, how many scripture texts do you recommend? Two to three. So, um, you know, and you can list more if you want to, but if they're really long, you know, more two. If they're short, three. Yeah. Dr. Kenneth, I just asked you, yeah. um, it's interesting in the Jewish tradition, very often families don't speak at the funeral because it's their job to grieve. Mm. So should people feel an obligation? Not at so all. uncomfortable to watch someone suffering trying right. to read through something. Oh my gosh, yeah. Um, yeah. It's just something to think about. Yeah, know, absolutely. It supports the family that's grieving. And I thought, that was like almost a relief. Yeah, <laughs> yes, you know? yeah, and, and I, you know, I, I've done a few funerals where no one spoke, and I, you know, I always say it's if you want to, you know, it's not, you know, if there's nobody who wants to, or you know, and that's that's why I say friends are a good idea, you know, if if you want to still have someone who maybe knows mm -hmm. you better, you know, if if you know if, if I'm not here, I say you know if you have a pastor who maybe you don't know, sometimes it's helpful to have someone with with that insight, um, but it's not. You know, not I just think sometimes feel obligated. No, 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 not I at should all. stand up, you know. Yeah, no, not at all. There's no... Still going to throw that out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So we're going to spend a couple... Oh, I went longer than I thought. I'm so sorry, friends. Uh, we're going to spend a few minutes just filling these out, maybe five or six minutes, and just to start thinking about you. And you don't want to fill this all out now, um, but to start thinking about I'm going to put up a couple of scripture texts up here. Um, we also have hymnals under all the chairs there, and I have Bibles back here that I'm going to throw out on the table as well. Um, but just jot down a couple things. It doesn't have to be fully filled out. Um, and like I said, you can throw this away on your way out, so you don't need to. Um, and then I'll answer questions at the end um, and go over just a couple more little things. So we'll just spend a few minutes doing this. Yeah, if you could pass this one.
But um, how's the thing, how do you feel about kind of reflecting on what you want to have included? Is there a hymn that you love or a scripture that you love that has to be read? Um, any reflections on, on this sort of planning process? That's great, yeah. yeah. Beth, I see stuff written down. What's one of your hymns or scriptures that has to be? Well, I'm starting with it. I, I don't know the, by the number or the actual title. Oh, yeah. Uh, I will definitely look through my hymnal at home and yeah. make selections. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, for me, um, it is well with my soul. If it is not sung, it's not my funeral. So that will be that will be in my funeral. Is that my ordination? It'll be in my funeral. Start to finish. Yeah. It is well with my soul or peace like a river, whichever um, those titles. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh yes, like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, I would do that very strategically. I would be more like, "What's your favorite scripture passage, Mom?" You know, or like, "What do you, you know, if you're talking about church or whatever it is that you're talking about?" You know, if she, you know, if she doesn't care about this, like. We, we don't want to push anybody to do something. Or, 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 yeah, or doesn't. There's yes. a lot of yes. stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would, you know, while it may not be a very pointed conversation, like, like, fill this out, you know. Yeah. I think, you know, in conversation, you know, talk about, I heard a sermon, you know, that I loved. And, you know, it had, they talked about this. Oh, what do you like? You know, what are, what are you? What's meaningful to you, you know, and that kind of thing. But you know, ultimately, it it is for you, you know. And so, um, you know, even filling it out yourself, you know, of what you think of as like this reminds me of mom, you know. This this I think this would capture her and who she is. So. Yeah, because I think ultimately that's what's going to have to happen. Yes. Yeah. 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 She's going to be there, but she's not going to hear a thing, so you know, <laughs> yeah. do what you want to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ultimately, you know, it's it's whatever you want and what you think captures her. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, let me let me answer a few questions, um, and then we'll close in prayer. I'm going to read um, one of the prayers from here. So um, I think we went through a lot of this. Um, haven't picked out a place yet. Um, I can't remember who asked that, but um, you know, haven't. It's it's hard, you know, to figure out where do I want to be buried. You know, I think one of the key questions to ask yourself and ask those you love is, do you want to have a burial or do you want to be cremated? You know, and that's just a conversation that has to happen. Um, many folks, you know, will will be very open about it. Some people are like, I don't know, I don't care. Um, like my dad, he wants his body going to science. That's it. He doesn't care. He's like, that's what I want. Um, well, my mom, I don't know what she wants, but I know what hymns she wants. I know what music she wants to have. Um, so it's really, you know, but that's a conversation and question, um, to ask yourself and ask, um, those that you love. Um, let's see. Uh, what if the person passes but is not a part of a church? So, you know, as I said, I go out, I do funerals for anybody who needs once a funeral. So, um, you know, and if you have a loved one who maybe isn't a part of the church, we can still make it happen. It, it could be here. Unfortunately, if they're not a member, there is a cost to it. If you're a member, there's a tinier cost for the musician and the sexton. Um, it's more if you're not, if the person who passed away isn't a member here. Um, but we can also go to a funeral home and we can be creative if if cost is a, is a factor. Um, it is still deserved a funeral if you have just a graveside. So in my thinking, the graveside portion is still a service. Yeah, I call it a graveside service. Even though it's only 10 minutes long, it's still a service. Um, you know, if, if the person, if, if, you know, it's a, you know, sometimes if it's a small family, if there just it aren't any friends left, um, sometimes they will do that. Um, or, or if it's, you know, someone who, you know, they don't want a funeral and they want to have more like a celebration and party kind of thing, um, sometimes that will happen. But I, I still consider the graveside still a service, um, and, I, and I treat it as such and have done, you know, some of those. 
um, how much feedback input to the rest of the family, you know. Um, for me, I'm always listening to those one or two people who I'm communicating with. While it's wonderful to get feedback from the whole family, ultimately it is a quick turnaround. You can't make everybody happy, and, and that's okay. You know, and don't put pressure on yourself for those of you who are planning the funerals of loved ones. It's, it, it is what it is. Ultimately, everybody's pretty happy with how funerals go, you know, because it, you know, they are getting the comfort um, that they need, and they didn't even, you know, think about what goes into a funeral oftentimes because we only have so many that we're um, attending. Some of us more than others for those of us who are in the church. But, um, you know, I, you can get input from some family members, but don't do too much. Don't, don't worry about that. Um, let's see. How much family participation? Yeah, we kind of touched on that. Um, you know, you can have nobody reading, doing eulogies. You can have, you know, two eulogies and a reading for everybody, you know, and or, you know, singing or, or, or what have you. So um, it's as much or as little as you want. Um, and then younger or older, you know, with um, funerals for a younger person, it's still, you know, it's, there's still elements of celebration, you know, this, this funeral that I, we were looking at for that woman, there, there was a lot of humor in it, you know, because she was a really, you know, fun-loving person who loved New York, and I made that connection, being from New York, and said some things about that, and, and it was really meaningful for the family and, and the people, but um, it's definitely different, you know, it's, it, there's a different tone to it when it's, you know, someone who dies tragically versus someone who's maybe had a long illness or lived a long life. Um, there's a, a different tone, um, for sure, but I don't care when I go, mine, mine has to be a party, so if you all attend my funeral, it better be a party, and then you better tell the people who are planning it, you better run if, if it's not, so, yeah. Any other questions, comments, yeah? Are there, um, Presbyterian cemeteries, um, around that people... You know, it's different in every location, and I don't know, um as much here as where I was previously, just because I'm still learning where everything is, but um, there really aren't any specifically Presbyterian seminary, cemeteries. So there's, um, you know, there's a few ar around the area, which, you know, we have folks buried, you know, all over the place. Um, it's really up to you where you want to choose to be. Um, you know, we have our, our little garden back here, unfortunately, it's all filled up. I, I'm, I'm really hoping at some point we'll have another garden because I want to be very here. Like, this is like such a fabulous little place to, to visit and to, to be in. So maybe someday, you know, we'll have, have another space here. So we'll see. Yeah. Uh, being Veterans Day, um, it's appropriate to remind everybody that the, per that, the, yeah, that the deceased is a veteran and the Veteran Administration will provide a a grave marker free of charge, mm -hmm. which is a big expense, and uh, yeah. a flag, and you know, if you want the color guard there, you know, mm. usually the Legion can do that. Yeah, good, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, it, because I, I it, it, that is something to be thinking about, and often that is noted, and, and then there are some people, you know, my grandfather was a veteran, he didn't want any of that, and you know, he just chose not to, that was just his um, choice, so it's really, you know, every, everybody. Any other questions or comments or anything? Well, I'm so happy you all came. I was I was like, oh, we're gonna have two people show up, but you all came. It's so fabulous. So <laughs> you you all are planners, which I am. I plan absolutely everything. So um, including my funeral. So um, so here we are. So I'm gonna read. Um, this is one of the prayers that I often use um, at graveside um, services. So I'm going to just close with this prayer and then we'll go into our day. So let's pray, friends. Oh God, support us all the day long until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at last. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Have a lovely rest of your day, and I'm sure I will see you all, if not this week, on Sunday.
Oh, they go in that closet there, yeah.